Amen. So this is that small little book near the end of uh, your Bibles there. And it's very, very short. You notice that, right? So that said, I came across a tongue-in-cheek list of the world's shortest books, okay? It includes the following pretend titles, okay? World's shortest books. America's Most Popular Lawyers. Everything Men Know About Women. Definitely a short book. Engineer's Guide to Fashion. I love that one. Um, The Amish Phone Directory. And then finally, it might include Pastor Ron's jokes that are funny. That's, okay, that was really bad. But think about this. Compared to all the other books in the Bible, 3 John is kind of like a postcard. It only has 14 verses. It comprises 295 words in the original language. But it does pack a punch. It is very personal. It is very practical. And somewhat similar to the book before it, which is 2 John, another small book. And whereas 2 John talks about the importance of walking in truth, this book talks about our witness, our example. I read this week about a TV uh, cable man um, who didn't think so much of his own work when he came to work on the job when he came back home. He really kind of just tossed that out. As a result, he never bothered to install the satellite dish on top of his own home properly. And when the base broke in a windstorm, he just left it. Now, that is a background. A new family had just moved in next door, and the owner decided to install his own satellite dish on his roof. Seeing that his next-door neighbor was a cable man, he could see the van in his driveway, he thought to himself, I'm going to put mine up just like him. He must know what he's doing. So he put the satellite dish up in the same direction on his roof, and without hesitation, he broke the base of it, thinking he would get better reception. I thought about it, I thought, you know, whether we like it or not, we're setting an example for other people. People are watching us. And of course, those of us who are parents know all too well about that. Our children imitate and mimic our good qualities as well as our bad qualities, our strengths and weaknesses. And the same is true concerning God's people within the house of God. God's people are watching us and the world is watching us. So the question we have to ask ourselves and just think as we move into this book is, what example do people see in my life? Am I a stumbling block or am I a stepping stone? Am I a hindrance to the gospel or am I help and aid to the gospel? One person wrote this, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather a person walk with me than merely show the way The eyes are a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel can be confusing, but examples are always clear. So true. So John in this letter gives us three examples demonstrated by three men. Two of them good, one of them bad. And, of course, our intention is to learn from all three. So you may want to write in the margin of your Bible or in your notes, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. It says this. Hold fast to what is good and shun what is evil. So that's always our intent. Now, I've entitled our message today an example to follow. Again, John talks about three men, the example they set, and how it affected the people and literally the church they were part of. So we'll look at three things this morning. We're going to look at the uh, commendation, then the condemnation, and then thirdly, the commitment. Now, we begin with the commendation. Well, we're going to look at the first three verses on this. And, and we, first of all, need to talk about the introduction. Notice how John, who was the pastor of this church, introduces himself. He says, the elder. You've probably heard that term before in the Greek language. It's presbytus. You've heard about a Presbyterian, right? Well, this is the Greek word presbytus. It means mature. Now, John is introducing himself as the presbytus of the church. The, he's really the pastor. There are three terms that the New Testament uses to describe the office of a pastor. First, there are, there's the word pastor. We're familiar with that. That's poimano. That means to shepherd. The other word besides this word is bishop. You've probably heard that before. The Greek word is episkopos. Epi means over. Scopus, we get scope from, it means to see. So it means one who oversees. Now, all three describe the same office. All three are used in one verse. In 1 Peter 5, 1, Peter, who was the pastor of a church, said this, 
the elders, presbytus, of whom I am among, I exhort you to shepherd poimano, the flock of God which is among you, serving as an overseer, an episkopos. So you have three functions as a pastor. I just thought I'd throw that out for you so you know. If you use the term bishop, it emphasizes his function. He is to oversee the church. Using the term poimano, pastor, it emphasizes his care for the office. He is to feed and to lead the flock. And the term elder used here, presbytos, really emphasizes his character. He is spiritually mature. Now, it's interesting. John just introduces himself as the elder. Why not say, hey, it's John, like sometimes he does in his letters? Well, notice, by the way, he doesn't even use the word an elder, but he says the elder. So most likely, who he's writing to, they knew who he was. That's the first thing. There's another possibility is that he doesn't use his name at this time because of persecution. But either way, we know that John wrote this. He's the elder. He's the pastor. And he's writing to who? Beloved Gaius. Now, we don't know exactly who this man is, only because we know that there are quite a few men in the New Testament called Gaius. So we're not certain which one it is. What we do know is this. He's a godly man and one we want to follow. First of all, John calls him beloved Gaius. That's a term used three other times in this letter alone. And it's used in the New Testament simply to describe believers, those who love God. And then notice John adds, whom I also love in truth. See, we have fellowship with one another. Those believers who love God and, and we love one another, that's what we should do. If you love God's brothers, love one another. John wrote that in his first letter. And then he adds, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, this was a very common greeting. The word prosper means to do well. Uh, today, we might say, hey, I hope things or I trust things are going well. In fact, Stott says, writing of ancient times, that this greeting was so common, sometimes it was even reduced down to initials. And you know, we do that sometimes when we write. If we do write, a lot of times we're just doing email, right? But we might end it saying P.S. instead of actually putting the words postscript. Or we might end a letter with swack, sealed with a kiss, right? Well, that's how common this greeting was. Now, I say that only because this, what was intended to be a typical greeting has been twisted today by prosperity preachers who say that this verse guarantees the believer's material wealth and physical health, what we call the health and wealth or the prosperity doctrine. And so they teach that there are mysterious keys in the Bible, and when you unlock them, you can unlock principles so that you will be physically healthy and materially wealthy. And this is one of the passages that they use. That's improper. I want you to know that. In fact, consider this. The Bible is full of many godly Christians who never prospered in a physical matter, yet flourished spiritually, right? And that goes on today. Listen, John is simply praying that Gaius might be in health physically as he was spiritually, his soul prospered. Now, this tells us two things, though, about this man. And you can pronounce this man Gaius or Gaius, however you want to do that. But one is, John is praying, or paying, I should say, Gaius say, a compliment. He's affirming the fact that he's a strong believer, right? Man, you're doing so well, your soul prospers, and I pray that your health would be like that, which tells us a second thing. Most likely, he wasn't doing well physically. Most likely, he was sick. And you know, we find this in many passages in the New Testament. When Paul was writing to his friend uh, Epaphroditus in the book of Philippians, he said in chapter 2 and verse 6 that Epaphroditus was so sick almost unto death because of his work for Christ. And you know what? Sometimes your work can, for Christ can be so taxing on your physical body. I feel that a little bit more from time to time that you become ill. And then think about this. That's true of all of us the older we get. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says this, our outward man is perishing, but the inward man can be renewed day by day. 
So as long as we're living in these fallen bodies, uh, uh, against completely what this health and prosperity doctrine teaches, the bottom line is, even if they teach health and wealth prosperity, you're going to die one day. And that's, that's what we look forward to, is being with Jesus. But the Bible doesn't promise us perfect health or wealth just because we follow Jesus. In fact, I like what one commentator stated, quote, God may, according to his all-wise plan, use the lack of material prosperity and physical health to promote greater prosperity and health in the scale of eternity, amen, which is far greater. Now, let's move on to verse three. John writes, for I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Again, Gaius, that's who he's writing to. Just as you walk in truth. Here we begin to see the commendation. And let me say this, how did John hear about the testimony of this man? Well, it tells us here, because brethren came and testified. Some believers had been there at the church and they were reporting to John and they were saying, man, this guy, Gaius, he's such a godly example. Well, what made his example so godly? It tells us here, the believers testified of the truth that was in him. They were testifying of truth that is in this man. Well, when we talk about truth, what kind of truth are we talking about? Well, you can write down John 17, 17. Jesus said this, thy word is truth. And then we're exhorted, here's another passage in Colossians 3, 16. It says, let the word of Christ, this truth, dwell in you richly. So what John is commending Gaius for is doing just that. Here was a man whose truth was in him. God's word was in him. He read the word, he studied the word. He meditated on the word. He allowed the word, the truth, to saturate his being. And because of that, the end of verse three, we're told that he then walked in it. So he not only got it in, he lived it out. Isn't that great? Now, when we see this term walk, it represents in the Bible one's lifestyle. Throughout the Bible, the Christian life is uh, seen as a, a walk. We're told to walk in love. We're told to walk in the light. We're told to walk in wisdom. We're told to walk in the spirit. And so our Christian walk is not a sprint. It doesn't say sprint in love. Sprint in the spirit. And then, you know, you're all done. No. Then you fizzle out. Burst of energy and then fizzle out. No. It's not a crawl either. It doesn't say crawl in love. Oh, man, I'm trying, brother. I'm trying to love you, man, but I just can't get there. No. It's a walk, and a walk denotes consistency. A walk speaks of a steady progression forward. It's one step at a time. God calls us to trust him step by step, day by day. A walk is refreshing. A walk is rejuvenating. And when we walk in this truth, it is refreshing. It is rejuvenating. We're walking in step with God in his word, in the spirit. And man, what an example that sets. And so John even writes in verse four, knowing that that's his testimony. Listen, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walking in truth. Which, by the way, as a side note, leads us to believe that John led this man to Christ. He refers to him as his child in the faith. And having led him to Christ, years later, he's reading of his testimony, using his testimony for us in his word. And he's excited about it. And let me tell you this, I'll tell you there is nothing more exciting for a pastor than to have led people to Christ and then to hear later, as years go on, they're still following the Lord. Um, I, I have to say, you know, if Jesus took me now, and uh, my wife says, don't say that because she doesn't like what I, but I'm telling you, if the Lord took me, I have, I have more than I've ever wanted, more than I've ever wanted. And to have been used by God in any way, it's so humbling to have led people to Christ in other countries, around the world, in our own, it just, and to know they're walking with Jesus. Listen, I, I just got a letter not too long ago, it was a couple weeks ago. I had led both the husband and the wife to Christ when they were teenagers in high school. And they were writing to me, they live in New Hampshire now, and they wrote back to me saying, here's a picture of our children now, we're serving the Lord in the ministry. I mean, I just about fell over my seat, you know. 
I get excited about that. How awesome is that? And you know how awesome that is too when you hear about people you love so much, even if you were deeply involved in leading them to Christ or discipling them in the faith, still walking, it's like touchdown, you know. On the other hand, nothing is more discouraging, heartbreaking than to know of someone who at one time was walking with Jesus and then they walk away from him. That's hard. But here we have the commendation. The first commendation is, hey, Gaius is walking in the truth. But there's another one about his life. He, he is faithful. Look at verse five. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do. Everything you're doing, you're faithful in it. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, we're told to be servants of the mystery of God. And moreover, it's required in these servants or stewards that one be found faithful. We're to be faithful. Everything we do should be faithful to our Jesus. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do it heartily to the Lord so that one day, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, you're gonna hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. Now enter into the joy of your Lord. Wow. So beloved, verse five, referring to Gaius, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Now, this is interesting. What is he referring to here? At first, you might not understand how he kind of changes gears here a little bit. Well, in ancient times, pastors and evangelists, when they had to travel from place to place, they relied upon the hospitality of other believers in local churches to take them in. They didn't have uh, Holiday Inns and Hiltons back then. There were some inns in very large cities, but they were notorious for prostitution, crime, disease, not a desirable place to stay. So traveling pastors and ministers, as well as Christians, would rely on the hospitality of other believers. And John is commending Gaius here because he would open up his home to these brethren, even some who were strangers. Now, let me quantify that. When he talks about strangers, he's not talking about taking somebody in he doesn't even have a clue who they are. In fact, in 2 John, and you could read that later, it won't take you much more than a couple minutes, he talks there about being discerning who you allow to come into your home. Why? Because false teachers make a habit, still do today, of coming to the door to gain an audience. So when John talks about taking in strangers, he's not talking about just letting everybody in. Most traveling ministers and pastors at that time, and even Christians, would have letters of commendation from their congregation when they travel. So strangers, yes, you don't know who they are, but you had letters to come along with it. I remember years ago when we had Hurricane Katrina, Rock, Louisiana. Man, any of you here this morning, you came from Louisiana during the hurricane? Anybody here? Okay, we got a couple of you here. Great. Listen, when that happened, tens of thousands of people from Louisiana came and made this their home. In fact, I remember going down and working in the Astrodome. Oh, my goodness, was it a sea of people. And that was just the beginning of it. And uh, so we had asked the church back then, would any of you be willing to take some people into your homes? And we had some people do that. But we didn't just do it blindly. We actually would contact the people they were from, family and church, if they had a church, to have letters or words of commendation. So here John is commending Gaius for his hospitality, entertaining strangers. By the way, there's a great verse, of course. You probably know it. Hebrews 13, too, great verse. Don't forget to share hospitality to strangers, for some have done so and entertain angels unaware. And a case of point is Genesis chapter 18. That's exactly what Abraham did. He gave hospitality to a couple strangers. They end up being angels. So be hospitable. Now again, how does John hear about the hospitality of Gaius here? From people in the church. It says in verse six, they have borne witness of your love before the church. Now, let me just, a little side note here. Gaius was doing a great work, right? Helping people, doing lots of great things. But who told John about it? Did Gaius, hey, John, I just want you to know I'm an awesome dude. I've been doing great things in the church. I think you should promote me to deacon or elder or something, you know. No. It tells us here 
they bore witness of his love. I just wanna encourage you, you know, you never have to commend yourself. You never have to do that. I don't care, and I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking in the world. You don't have to commend yourself at your, at your place of work. You don't have to go around and say, I do this, and I do this, and I do that, and I've done this, and I, you don't need to do that. Did Daniel do that? Daniel was a teenager, castrated, his family killed, left for nothing over in Babylon, and God used that young man and raised him up to be one of the greatest men in the Persian Empire. And he didn't commend himself. You don't have to commend it yourself. When God wants to commend you for the work you do, he'll do it. He just does it natural. People will talk about you in a good way. <laughs> we'll talk about a bad way in a moment. But I just love that. Here they go. He's just doing a great way. And then he adds at the end of the verse, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well. Now, that term send forward literally means to assist, to give assistance. So it's believed not only did Gaius provide a place for them to stay, but when they departed, he helped them with food, maybe even some funds to help them. That would certainly be in a manner worthy of God. And John says, because of that, you do well. By the way, again, just on this little parentheses here, he also gives us the criteria. Let's say you're gonna have someone stay at your house. Really, what's the best criteria? Did you know he gives us two of them right here? First of all, they should have pure motives. Look at verse seven. Because they went forth for his namesake. These people that stayed with you, these pastors that stayed with you, or even Christians, they went forth because of his namesake. They weren't here just for their own self-glory. They were here for the glory of God. Psalm 115.1, go ahead and read that on your, own, on your own. So they were ministering for God's glory. So when you take people in, do they love Jesus? That's a good one to ask. Number two, do they trust God for their provision? Notice he says, taking nothing from the Gentiles. Now he's referring to Gaius bringing in pastors and letting them stay at his home. And it's interesting in what he says about these pastors and these evangelists and even others is that they were not making appeals to Gentiles to really, here it's used in the context of non-believers. I don't believe the church should do that whatsoever. I think that cheapens the gospel. The, the church does not need the world's support. We just need to trust Jesus. In fact, let me just remind us, we all need to trust Jesus for everything that we have. Do you know that? A great book that really ministry, it's really not a book, it's his life, J. Hudson Taylor. He was the first missionary to inland China. Um, and he wrote this. He never asked for, a, appealed for funds or anything. And he said this, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. You're doing God's work, what God's called you to do, you're doing it God's way, you're doing it in a right way, upright with integrity, you'll never lack God's supply. Never, you'll never. God is faithful. Now look at verse eight. We therefore ought to receive such that they may become fellow workers with the truth. Now this is interesting. Again, he's talking about these strangers, these traveling pastors that stay with them. They, they did it for God's glory. They weren't seeking anything to themselves. And therefore, he says, he's right now to the whole church, just like Gaius did, we should receive these kind of people that, they may be, that we can become fellow workers for the truth. In other words, we become linked with people who we support when it's godly. Oh man, this is a great, great example. In fact, let me give you a couple examples from the Bible on this whole principle. David, King David, um, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, he was going from battle to battle, and, and there was a time where he just had to keep pressing through, and some of his troops got so tired, they said, we can't go, you, go with you to the next front, we're exhausted. So David said, you, go, you guys stay back here. There was 200 of them. You stay back and guard the supplies while we go to the front. And then in 1 Samuel 30, 21, it says this. Now, when David's men came back from the victory and met up with the 200, they said, they didn't come to war with us, so they can't have any of the plunder. But David said, no, my brothers, don't be selfish with what God has given us. He has kept us safe from the enemy. Listen to this. We share and share alike. You wonder where that came from? It's right there. That's 1 Samuel 30 and verse 24. We share and share alike. Those who go to the battle as well as those who stay behind and guard the equipment. So it became a law in the land, it says. So when we're involved in helping support those that are on the front lines, like missions, we get to partake in the fruit in which they're doing. That's why I love supporting missions, because we're all part of that. When we give, we're part of what God is doing. Isn't that a blessing? Let me give you another passage. Let's turn to this one, Matthew chapter 10. 
Turn to Matthew chapter 10. And Jesus talked about this. Just one simple little verse, but it's potent, speaks on this issue. Matthew 10, 41, that's to your left, first book in the New Testament. It says this, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So when you're supporting a prophet, a pastor, or an evangelist, or a missionary, you, you, you get to partake in the reward, at least spiritually, of what God is doing. And he who receives a righteous man, in a righteous man's name, will receive a righteous man's reward. So in God's economy, we share and share alike. Again, not everyone's called to be an evangelist. Not everyone's called to be a missionary. But we can help with those who do so, and we get to partake of the rewards. All right, now you go back to 3 John. You didn't realize there are so many things in this little book, did you, right? But we see here why God commended Gaius. He was a godly man. He demonstrated a love for God's people. He had a gift of hospitality. Now, we need to move on to our second example. I'm not gonna get through this. We, we move from the commendation to the condemnation. And we read this, verse nine. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. I read this week that the average person eats 87 hot dogs. I know you're wondering where I'm going with this. Diotrephes was a hot dog. That's bad, huh? He loved the spotlight. He wanted to be the top dog. He loved to run the show. Woodrow Wilson said of his proud associate one day, he is the only man I know who can strut while sitting down. <laughs> that is not a compliment. Diotrephes was that. He wanted to strut his stuff. He wanted to be a hot dog. He was power hungry. He wanted to be in control. And here's an interesting thing. As we look this name Diotrephes in secular history, Greek history, it's always associated with aristocracy. So it is quite possible that this man was upper class, accustomed to having things done his way, the way he wanted it, and he brought that attitude into the church. He learned how to manipulate, how to intimidate, how to dominate. Even down in verse 9, he, re, he tells John, you, I don't even want you coming to this church, you know. This man was filled with pride. At some point, he was given responsibility in the church in John's absence and went right to his head. Can I remind you of how we should be in the church and in life? Mark 10, 42. And I'm reading it out of the message. It's very clear. Jesus said to his disciples, you observe how godless rulers throw their weight around? And when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads, it's not to be that way with you. Whoever wants to become great should be a servant. God calls us to be servants, not sergeants. He calls us to be disciples, not dictators. In 1 Peter 5, 2, it tells us we're not to do things for dishonest gain or out of compulsion, but being examples to the flock. I read something this week, I, I like baseball. Bob Feller, when he was only 17 years old, he signed with the Cleveland Indians, and yes, they used to call it the Cleveland Indians back then. Those of you who know baseball know all about that whole thing. But he signed, and the trainer took him aside to get his uniform. He said, son, how does your uniform fit? And uh, Feller said, well, the cap is a little big around my head. The trainer replied, see that it stays that way. <laughs> Isn't that a good word? That's a good word for all of us. Because I think about Satan. His name in heaven was Lucifer, son of the morning, given the privilege to be the worship leader before the very throne and presence of God. It went to his head. It wasn't enough for him. And Isaiah 14, 13, he said, I'm going to ascend to heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne. I'm going to ascend on the mount of the congregation. I'm going to ascend to the heights of the clouds, and I will be like God. Five times. He had an eye problem. God cast him down. Why? James 4, 6, because God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the humble. Oh, I, th I think the classic example would be John the Baptist. Talk about a man who could have taken opportunity. He's, he's, he's the main dude on, on the menu in town, man. Everybody, it says all of Judea came out to see him. Many people even thought he was the Messiah. Crowds, huge crowds. But you know what he did? He said, the one who comes after me, I'm not worthy to unloose his sandals. In fact, Jesus, he needs to increase. I need to decrease. 
That, that's the example. How about Philippians 2, 3? That's a verse for us then. It says this, let nothing, it doesn't say let a few things, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, we are to esteem others better than ourselves. Man, that's a verse for all ages. We could be working on that one our whole life, right? And we should be. But this is Diotrephes. He wanted the preeminence. Verse 10, therefore, if I come, John says, I will call to mind the deeds which he does, pratting against us with malicious words. The word pratting is an interesting word. It means to bubble up. It means to have like foam. If you ever get foam or bubble in the bubble bath and you got a, a, you know, a little bubble, right? A little bubble that surrounds it. You know what's inside that bubble? Nothing. It's empty. That's what the word means. It means empty talk, useless talk. But then he combines with it's useless talk, but it's malicious, which literally means it's evil and harmful. So Diotrephes spoke evil and harmful things against the pastor, against John, Empty of truth. But I'll tell you what, the damage was done. And I've shared with you this story many times. And I'll, I tell you what, I should probably share it every six months because I see it happening all the time in our church. And I see it happening in churches across America more than ever before, all over in the church and in social media. And it's called gossip. So I've shared this story with you before, though, about a young man who came to the pastor. He came clean and said, Pastor, I need to tell you, I've been spreading gossip. But I want to apologize. What do I need to do? Well, the pastor said, first of all, what I want you to do is take this sack of feathers, and I want you to go, and I want you to place this feather on the doorpost of all the people, on the doorstep of all the people you gossip to, and then come back and see me. And the young man did. And then the pastor said, so you did that? Yep. He goes, well, now I want you to go and gather them all up. Well, he said, I can't. By now, they've all blown everywhere. yes. It's impossible to do so, you're right. And so has your gossip been spread everywhere and you'll never be able to retrieve it all. Yes, there is forgiveness, but the damage you have done is in many times irreversible. So we need to be very careful of how we use these lips. This tongue, right? You know, don't you think, don't you think that God knows what he's doing when he caged our tongue with all this cage of teeth? Hold on to it, you know what I'm saying? Hold on. Don't be a gossip. Can I also say this? Don't listen to a gossip. If you stop it right away, and by, well, let me just say this back up from that. First of all, if someone gossips to you about someone else, they'll eventually gossip about you. It's just, I've seen it a hundredfold. But don't give time to a gossip. Stop it in its track. Say, hey, you need to go to that person, and I don't want to hear that. You should go directly to that person. I remember the story of Pastor Chuck, my pastor in Costa Mesa. This is a huge church, and uh, assistant pastor there hears words of one of the guys that I'm actually good friends with now, much older gentleman than me, but he was a young pastor at the time, and he started talking, saying something about, you know, Pastor Chuck. Well, you know, he was doing this. And the pastor said, hey, you know what? I need to talk to you. Come on around the corner over here. And he went to a back way of the office that he didn't know, and they ended up right there in Pastor Chuck's office. And he said, hey, um, so-and-so wants to talk to you. <laughs> Gulp. That's what we should do. That's exactly what we should do. Hey, let me take you over here. You're talking about him. Let's get him on the phone. You should tell him, and, and you really should. If you have a problem with your brother, make it right. Make it right. That's the thing. But put an end to it. Proverbs 26, 20 says, where there is no wood the fire goes out. And where there's no talebearer, no gossip, the strife ceases. It's pretty simple. Now, moving on, not only did Diotrephes spread lies about John, he was maliciously saying stuff about the pastor, but he adds in verse 10, he was not content with that. He himself doesn't even receive the brethren. In other words, he says, look at anybody coming to the church, you're honing in on my territory. Don't you know who I am? I'm, I'm Diotrephes, you know. And he forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. You get out of here. We don't have time for you. Can you imagine that? This guy is so consumed with pride and ego that he wanted to protect his little kingdom, you know. But that'll come to an end. It always does. I, I'm, I, I, I'm very fearful of those people that get caught up in that stuff because time catches up. And this is what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride will go before destruction. A haughty spirit will come before a fall. In other words, you're that way like a diatrophies, 
then there's certain destruction and there is certain fall. Why? Because God resists the proud, but he gives his grace to the humble. So here we see this example we don't want to fall, right? We have the commendation of Gaius. We have the condemnation of Diotrephes. But now we have the commitment of another gentleman here in verses 11 through 14. And John begins with some real practical advice. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. Again, he just gave the example of do not. Don't be like that, but imitate what is good. And again, I had you write in the, the, maybe the side of your Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. If you didn't do it, then do it again. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. We're going to have those examples all the time. Choose the right ones. And imitate it, he says. The Greek word is mimitai, or literally mimic. Mimic. Now, here's another man to mimic or to follow. Demetrius has a good testimony. Follow his examples. Now, you might say, hold on a second. Why do we follow human examples? Shouldn't we follow Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, we want to follow Jesus. The only thing is we have Jesus in the word, and that's wonderful. But the Lord has also given us human examples that we can follow. And sometimes it helps to actually interact with someone who's right there in front of your face. Even the Apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, imitate me, same word, mimic me as I mimic Christ. Now, if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. And I say the same thing about my life, for sure. And we all should. But if we're following Christ, then, then imitate that. Now, notice he says of Demetrius, he does good. He who does good is of God. But he who does evil has not seen God. Now, how about that? That's very straightforward truth. That's an axiomatic truth. It's in God's word. So think about this. If a person does good, he's of God. If someone is doing what the Bible says, he's of God. But if he's doing evil, like the former gentleman was, he has not seen God. He may say he's a Christian. He's going around, but if he's going around like a gossiper all the time, slandering people, what John says is he's not of God at all. You don't want to follow that kind of person. Now, again, in verse 12, John says, Demetrius has a good testimony. Check this out from all. Everybody who knows him says, man, that guy's right on. And not only does he have that testimony from others, John says he also has the testimony from the truth itself. And what is the truth itself? Again, John 17, 17. Thy word is truth. And what John is saying is here is not only are people talking well of him, but the word of God, his life lines up with the word of God. Isn't that something? So that when you look at his life as compared to the scriptures, you don't have accusation, you have affirmation. You don't have condemnation as the former, you have confirmation. And so the congregation bore witness, his life bore witness through the scriptures, and then John writes at the end of verse 12, and we also, John says, me and my companions also bear witness of Demetrius, and you know that our testimony is true. So this guy had, you might say, the trifecta of confirmations, right? The con con congregation said, Demetrius is right on. The scriptures compared to his life, he's right on. And John himself says, this guy's right on. Wow. So we have to think about our example, right? Someone said this, men look at us six days a week to see if what we say is true on the seventh day. Right? Demetrius had a great example. Now, John begins to wind up this long letter. No, it's not long, it's very short, right? Verse 13, I had many things to write to you, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly so that we can speak face to face. Now, it's one thing to write a letter, right? You write a letter and... I don't know how many of you write letters anymore, you email, whatever you do, but you'd much rather see them face to face. And I definitely think about this as I think about the holiday season. I know uh, every Christmas we're able to see my parents and several times a year we're able to see um, my wife's grandmother over in Cuba. But because we live in different locations, we can't see one another all the time. I can't see my parents this, this Christmas. So I'm gonna miss some of you can't see your family. So we long for those times when we actually see one another, right? We long for those times when we get to see, you know, uh, Yanni's grandmother who raised her. So all of those things, you love that. And you would much rather see them face to face. That's what John is saying. He just, with all the problems going on in this church, 
He so longed to see the people. And so he adds, peace to you. Isn't that something? I think that's significant. Because in this small little letter, he had to deal with conflict. But the ultimate purpose of confronting the conflict is always peace. Peace does not come in sweeping the problem underneath the carpet. Peace comes when you deal with it head on and say, hey, this needs to change. So he says, peace to you. Our friends greet you, in reference to the people that were with him. And then he closes by saying, greet the friends in my name. Greet those people that are with you. So you made it all the way through a book. Aren't you happy? Aren't you excited? We went through the whole book today. Awesome. But here we see three great examples. One bad, Diotrephes, driven by pride, speaking malicious lies. Then we have two good. Gaius, a man who demonstrated hospitality, a faithful man. Demetrius, a man who had godly character. And so again, we have to ask ourselves here, what kind of example am I setting? Am I setting the kind of example that people are attracted to? Not because I'm promoting myself, we don't need to do that as we talked about, but I'm reflecting, reflecting Jesus. We really, we're not the sun, Jesus is the sun, right? But we're like the moon. We reflect Jesus. We should be reflecting Jesus. Are we the kind of character that people wanna run from or run to, you know? Because we can make a difference in people's lives. If we made a difference in one person's life, that would be worth everything, right? I want to close with this. It's spoken to me many times over the years. I was, I probably won't cry this time. I was actually crying as I was putting together this message, reading this story again, because it, it, it just, it speaks about the power that we can make on people. Um, his name is L.W. Milne. He was a missionary, and he labored in a section of New Guinea about 150 years ago. And uh, in New Guinea at the time, the certain tribes people, and there were quite a few, were cannibals. And in fact, a lot of people would not even uh, unload their boats there. They would just drop stuff off and leave. They were fearful. But he served the majority of his life there, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's an incredible story. His converts, many of them were former cannibals, asked permission. He had passed away, and they wanted to place his marker on his grave with some inscribed words, which they did and which is still there to this day. This is what it reads. Here lies the remains of A.W. Milne. When he came to us, there was no light. When he died, there was no darkness. That's the way to live, my friends. Let's pray.